Uh, hello, this is our lecture number 38. This is on stress and health and prevention. And um, when, uh, you know, having just explored the whole area of behavior disorders and, um, you know, some of the, what we consider to be the causal factors and how to go about treating them, um, this area, the area of uh, what we refer to as health psychology is a an area that has grown uh, tremendously uh, over the last 20 or 30 years uh, to a point where I think that a lot of the, the jobs for uh, those individuals who have a background in psychology are, are either directly or indirectly related to the uh, health psychology um, industry. So we're going to learn a little bit about this particular area. Uh, because um, like, um, like many areas now in terms of uh, uh, medicine and public health, uh, it's all about prevention. And uh, psychology is no different. Uh, so again, let's, let's take a look at this area, talk a little bit about it in terms of uh, the important work uh, that goes on, the research that goes on, and uh, how this, uh, how this really evolved uh, over the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, the psychology of stress and health psychology, clearly one of the things that we know is that our health is influenced by, by many, many different things. Uh, whether we're talking about uh, the amount of stress that we're exposed to, the uh, exercise that we engage in, our family history, uh, various environmental factors um, uh, in terms of, let's say, contaminants that are, uh, are present in the environment. Um, uh, you know, there are many, many different factors that go into um, uh, our health. Uh, and indeed, the whole area of health uh, psychology is about um, understanding uh, those various factors and uh, how they impact us uh, in terms of health and how we can really lead better lives by eliminating some of these um, uh, underlying risk factors uh, and get that knowledge out to people so that they understand it. So um, again, the psychology of stress and health psychology is uh, you know, a growing uh, area uh, of psychological uh, investigation. Um, and again, like many of the areas that we've talked about, I mean, you could take a class, um, a semester long class in the area of health psychology. And indeed, I would encourage you to do so to the extent that you're interested in going on in psychology. So here are some of the questions that concern um, uh, this whole area of stress uh, in the psychology of health. Uh, we want to know the impact that stress has on our life, you know, how we go about coping with it psychologically uh, and uh, um, physiologically. Uh, we want to know the behavioral and social factors that make us sick. And indeed, that's been a huge emphasis uh, in this area. We also want to know the ways that health psychologists uh, have been able to prevent il illness uh, and improve our health uh, in terms of prevention. You know, that too is a huge area. So those are some of the questions that <clears throat> Hopefully, we're going to be able to answer um, as, as we go along. Uh, so let's talk about a pioneer in this area, um, um, a, uh, um, uh, a scientist uh, by the name of Hans Selye, a Canadian scientist uh, up at McGill University. Uh, he is considered to be the father of stress research, and he was the first one to propose what's called the general adaptation syndrome. <clears throat> and the adaptation syndrome, general adaptation syndrome, has to do with these various kinds of physiological changes that take place within us when we are exposed to stress, and that stress is chronic. So when you take a look at it, then one of the first things that, that happens is you become alarmed, and this is called the alarm and immobilization stage. That's when you're really first becoming aware that you are under a very stressful circumstance, a very stressful situation. Then there's what we call the resistance stage in which you're, you're preparing to uh, fight uh, that stressor. Uh, you're preparing to combat <clears throat> that stressor. 
And then lastly, we have what's called the exhaustion stage. Uh, again, if this stress uh, continues, uh, there are a lot of negative consequences, both physiologically and behaviorally. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the, the uh, organism eventually becomes um, exhausted uh, as a consequence of that chronic <coughs> uh, uh, stressful um, uh, experience that you encounter. So again, this is called the general adaptation syndrome. And again, it was first proposed by Hans Selye, uh, who was considered to be the, the father of stress research. So he proposed what was called the two system view, uh, where uh, the stressor impacts us uh, in terms of what is happening in our brain. There's two separate routes really for what is happening here. One is an impact upon the anterior pituitary gland <clears throat> uh, of our brain, uh, which uh, in turn um, uh, hormones from the anterior pituitary, namely ACTH, are stimulating the adrenal cortex, and the adrenal cortex uh, produces a secretion of uh, what are called glucocorticoids. What we also have simultaneous with this is the impact uh, that stress has on the sympathetic nervous system. And in this case, it's the adrenal medulla uh, that is being activated. Um, that's the, uh, uh, the inner core uh, of the adrenal gland, and it's the secretion of norepinephrine and epinephrine. So um, again, this is called the two-system view. It was proposed by uh, Hans Salye uh, a number of, of years ago in his uh, general adaptation syndrome uh, model. So what can stress do? Well, there's an expansive literature uh, in this area. It does many different things. It can alter the production of hormones in your body. It can actually uh, kill brain cells. Uh, it can shrink them, make them smaller. Uh, it can add fat to our abdominal area. It can actually, you know, on the microscopic level, we know now that it can unravel chromosomes, uh, can make us more susceptible to, to disease. Uh, it can alter our immune system. So these are well-known um, uh, characteristics of, of stress in terms of what stress can do to us. You know, we've known these things uh, for a while now. Um, there's a very famous study in this area of stress research, probably the most famous one. And it was conducted by uh, uh, Michael uh, Marmol uh, over in England. And um, again, this Whitehall study uh, that takes place um, in uh, England, uh, and it uses as subjects uh, civil servants. Uh, and again, the civil service uh, in, in England is quite expansive. Uh, it's a very stratified uh, civil servant uh, structure. Uh, and the reason why it's called the Whitehall study is that, that that's where the primary offices are of the uh, uh, civil service uh, in the Whitehall section of London, England. So um, what Marmol finds in this study, which is so fascinating, is that those individuals that are in lower grades, um, you know, people like doorkeepers and messengers and clerks, um, they're the ones that are really at risk for um, uh, health problems. Uh, things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity. Um, again, the lowest grades. Uh, when you compare those individuals with upper management, administrators, and so on, um, you don't see anywhere near the health problems that you see in the case of the lowest grades. Um, the critical factor in this study is that these are all individuals that are part of their socialized medicine system. Uh, so the healthcare is really the same for all civil servants. Uh, it's, not that, it's not the case, for example, that the lower grades have less access to uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, it's all the same. So uh, the results that they obtain in this study are, are, cannot be attributed to uh, differences in healthcare. Uh, one of the things that we learned as a consequence of Marmo's study is that uh, we can counter the effect of this stratification um, uh, where these lower grades, <clears throat> lower grade workers are the ones that are really experiencing many more health problems than than administrators, 
um, is the simple, uh, relatively simple idea of giving people control and input into decision making. Um, uh, that's going to reduce stress. That's going to going to uh, dramatically change uh, the amount of stress that an individual is being exposed to. If you feel as though you can make a difference, and you feel as though you're being listened to, and you feel as though you're part of the decision making process, <clears throat> that's really going to diffuse a lot of the effects of, of stress that occur in this very stratified uh, civil service system. So <clears throat> this is a study that had broad implications and it's one in which, um, you know, the focus uh, w was clearly on the impact of stress uh, upon health and upon behavior. Uh, and um, uh, this is considered really to be, you know, one of the most important pieces of work not only in psychology, uh, not only in the area of the of the uh, study uh, of the stress and health psychology, but really in all all of psychology. Again, the Whitehall uh, study. Once you start giving people control and you give them input, this reduces their stress, and what it also does is it changes. The degree to which individuals that are in these lower grades experience health problems. Uh, so again, there's you know our health is very much related to um, uh, the, the the status uh, that we are um, uh, present in uh, in uh, actually in many different cultures. Uh, so. <clears throat> Uh, again, this is not something that can be attributed to socialized medicine. Uh, can't be attributed to differences, any kind of differences in healthcare. It's equal for everybody. So this whole idea then to give control, to give input, uh, is crucial. Uh, I mean, you take a look at this concept in the case of a large bureaucracy. You know, one of the things that you realize is that that when you have this top-down kind of management system where you're constantly being told that you do x y and z and that you have little or no input into it um, that's devastating to an organization that's very counterproductive to an organization again based upon what we've learned from the uh, famous uh, study by Mar uh, michael marmo so <clears throat> again please keep that in mind as we go along so our conclusions then regarding, you know, stress, you know, has an enormous impact upon us and uh, upon our physiology and our behavior. And it, there's clear cut evidence that behavioral and social factors make us sick. Uh, and again, the psychology now, the discipline of psychology has really developed a lot of good methods and treatments uh, to prevent um, um, uh, uh, health uh, uh, problems. Uh, and to improve, uh, to prove health uh, and and our well-being. So again, <clears throat> when we take a look at that that area of health psychology in terms of our understanding of stress, uh, it becomes incredibly important for some of these interventions and strategies that we now have uh, for helping uh, individuals uh, that are uh, diagnosed with with some kind of a mental illness. Um, so prevention, that's a new focus in clinical psychology. This is a dramatically expanding area, um, uh, this field of health psychology. Uh, again, the, the focus is not so much now in terms of, you know, diagnosis and treatment. It's more along the lines of prevention, and that is what health psychology is all about. So there are some historical trends, really, in our thinking about the causes of death. Uh, I think, uh, you know, you asked the question, does psychology have anything to do with cancer? Does it have anything to do with heart de disease? <clears throat> does it have anything to do with the common cold? And the answer to that question, if you were to ask people about it 50 years ago, they would say, oh, absolutely not. That's got nothing to do with our behavior. And <clears throat> what we know now indicates that it very much has uh, an important impact upon um, our behavior. So this model that was advanced at this time called the biomedical model, that is what has really dominated our thinking about the causes of, of illness and death. Uh, and uh, as you will see, this is a model that really is, is no longer applicable uh, in terms of 
um, uh, prevention. Uh, so again, take a look at, at this biomedical model. That's really the, the primary basis uh, of, of Western medicine. Um, <clears throat> you know, in the early 1900s, disease was the primary cause of death. So when you take a look at it, uh, again, let's take a look at this from left to right. <clears throat> You're exposed to some kind of a pathogen uh, in this, what we call preclinical phase. Now there's uh, this onset of this disease uh, and then symptoms begin to appear. And this is the clinical, what we call the clinical phase, you know, diagnosis uh, is uh, uh, initiated. And we learn, for example, that <clears throat> this individual, you know, is a, uh, uh, going to start to receive uh, therapy uh, for their particular situation. And the, the cure, uh, as we go along, I mean, there could be a cure. The, the individual could live with the disease, um, could uh, deteriorate uh, over time and, and ultimately die. Um, so when we take a look at this, then, that um, certainly there's a possibility um, of a relapse. Um, uh, which would require some kind of a change in therapy. Um, <clears throat> but for the most part, we th we're talking about this, this whole idea uh, that the that, uh, disease is the primary cause of death and, and that it doesn't really have much, if anything, to do with our behavior. Uh, that's an important distinction, uh, and it's one that you, ref you should reflect upon a little bit. Um, because again, what it's what it's saying is that you know this uh, biomedical model, uh, you know, really is uh, critically important in, t in terms of understanding um, uh, just what uh, uh, mental illness uh, is a product of. So then, this biomedical model that becomes uh, the basis really of, of Western medicine. So uh, when we take a look at uh, the biomedical model's legacy uh, for healthcare, um, I think it's important to understand, you know, what uh, what this model uh, really kind of locked us into. Um, disease, you know, it's really all about disease. Uh, disease is, you know, some kind of malfunctioning in terms of our physical mechanisms. It's really got nothing to do with the mind at all. It's got nothing to do with our behavior, but it's all about these underlying biological mechanisms. Uh, anything that's not caused by this physical um, um, uh, malfunctioning, uh, that's really excluded. Uh, that's not something that we're interested in studying. That's not something that we're interested in rectifying. Uh, and again, when you take a look um, at uh, the, this legacy of the biomedical model, it's really saying that it's, you know, your health uh, is really all uh, physical. Uh, it, it's your, your physical health and your mental health. We want to treat those separately. We want to treat those differently. They're, they're really not connected uh, with one another. So again, if there's a behavior disorder that has a definite physiological cause, um, uh, a, a physical derangement, that's okay. All right. the, the, those are things that we certainly want to include in the biomedical model. But if it is not, then that's not something that we really want to help you with. Um, and again, uh, we're excluding um, that whole part of, uh, of the, uh, the, the existence, the being of an individual, uh, because we're not interested in the mental part. Uh, we're only interested in, in physical health. So again, we're going to treat those things separate from one another as if they are not connected. And indeed, the new reality, the new reality is the human mind influences all these things, it influences susceptibility, it influences resistance to disease. To, to disease. So again, these are, these are crucial factors. Um, again, biomedical model, that, that legacy is that we're definitely going to separate out, you know, behavior because that's really not important for um, uh, the biomedical model. You know, the, the mind is separate from, from the body. 
Uh, and again, uh, that now is just so wrong uh, in terms of how uh, we ultimately uh, uh, consider these very, very uh, important issues uh, like the impact of stress upon our behavior, uh, for example, that it's really, you know, has a behavioral component and it has a physiological component to it. So uh, when we take a look then uh, at what has happened um, uh, in, in this particular field and this, 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 just this terrible legacy um, uh, uh, for such a long period of time. But again, we've, we've transitioned um, now. So it's really these unhealthy lifestyle choices. It's not disease that's the leading cause of death today. Um, you know, poor eating habits, poor exercising habits, um, heart disease, uh, product, uh, product of, of, of these two things. Um, cancer, um, certain types of cancer, certainly, you know, smoking, you know, that's a decision that many people make, a poor decision, uh, which can lead to cancer. Uh, cirrhosis of the liver, where does that come from? It comes from the decision to drink alcohol and to drink a lot of it. Uh, car accidents, poor decisions, risky uh, behaviors, uh, uh, reckless kinds of behaviors that people exhibit. Uh, suicide, um, again, that's a decision. Uh, HIV AIDS, so that occurs as a consequence of uh, poor decisions uh, in terms of uh, entering into uh, sexual contact um, and not, not protecting yourself. So again, it's unhealthy lifestyle. Uh, it's not disease. Uh, that's the leading cause um, of death today. So um, again, you're going to be healthier and live longer. Again, eat regular meals. Don't smoke. Um, have a healthy weight. Uh, reduce your intake of alcohol, right? Get regular exercise. Get adequate sleep. Uh, use safe sex practices, drive safely instead of speeding. Uh, those are behavioral decisions, right? I mean, this has got nothing to do with pathogens. Um, uh, it's got everything to do with choices that you make. And indeed, there are good choices and there are bad choices uh, that, that uh, an individual is confronted with almost daily. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, your health. And again, what's going to make you healthier and what's going to allow you to live longer. Uh, so there are associations between psychological and physiological functioning. And again, just a couple of examples, you know, your immune system, your nervous system. You know, we know now that that can be modified by way of training. We recall some of the experiments that we discussed uh, that were conducted by Neil Miller uh, in terms of understanding uh, our immune system and how uh, uh, we can go about controlling um, our, our immune system. Uh, and again, this can be modified by way of experience. Uh, it can be modified by way of training and received training uh, in terms of, for example, relaxation training uh, can help your immune system in terms of its uh, uh, overall functioning you know, to lower the amount of stress, for example, that you're exposed to. We know that anxiety can have profound impacts upon your cardiovascular system and upon your immune function. It can have profound effects upon your behavior and it can be controlled through your behavior. Again, we know this, again, that whole unit that we took a look at in terms of learning, you know, dramatically uh, documents this uh, in terms of uh, these kinds of relationships that we can, in fact, learn to change our physiology. So the emphasis in psychology today is now on what we call the biopsychosocial model of disease, in which we're saying, yes, biology is important. Yes, um, you know, these uh, pathological states and disease and so on. Um, yeah, that's important. Uh, and we also have, you know, psychological factors. Uh, when we become depressed um, as a consequence of stress in our lives and the amount of anxiety that that produces. And there are social factors, you know, uh, being in isolation away from social contacts, that's not a good thing. Uh, we know that family matters. We know that friends matter. We, we know uh, that those things are, are very important. So we have these three different dimensions then in terms of um, uh, you know, our, our overall health. 
you know, yes, the origin uh, of this is biological, but, you know, the impact uh, of this can be felt uh, physically, psychologically, and socially. Um, so again, you know, your long-term health status, uh, uh, it's not just treated through uh, this bio, biomedical uh, uh, model alone. Uh, it has to be treated, uh, an individual has to be treated in terms of their, their psychological uh, makeup and their social makeup in their lives. And again, this quote down here in the bottom, the medical support keeps me alive, but it is the psychological and social support that enables me to live. That, that's a profoundly important statement, okay, in terms of um, uh, this emphasis today on what we call the biopsychosocial model of disease. So then, you know, let's do a little contrasting and comparing to make sure that we understand what the emphasis is in each one of these models. You know, the formerly the biomedical model, and then now uh, what uh, psychology uh, has adopted in psychiatry is this uh, biopsychosocial model. So in the biomedical model, we're focused on disease. We're focused on the physical status of the uh, of the individual. And um, it's very reductionistic. In other words, disease is defined by some kind of a biological defect. Um, and again, it's this old emphasis that the mind and the body are separate from one another. And indeed, they are not separate from one another. They are intimately connected with one another. And we have biological assays of, of examining this. Uh, you know, biological treatments are, are being emphasized. Okay, so that, that was the older biomedical model. The biopsychosocial model is saying something very different. What do we focus on? Well, it's prevention. We're focusing on wellness. Uh, we're saying that it's really, you know, your wellness, uh, your health is really a product of a number of different things. It's a product of a social factors, it's a product of psychological factors, it's a product of biological factors. So what we're saying then, in contrast to what the biomedical model is saying, is that we are integrating the mind and the body, that they are not separate from one another, they have to be treated together. So the treatments can be from an array of different things. They can be behavioral, they can be biological, they can be environmental. So you see then this is a very different way, okay, of viewing um, a health. Uh, and it is one that more substantially incorporates um, uh, uh, psychological and social factors as being determinants of our health. Uh, and again, this is such a departure from that biomedical model. And now we're finally at a stage where we're diverting more resources uh, into that um, biopsychosocial model where you know, not only is it our biological status, but it's our psychological status and social status. And what that means is that psychology has an even bigger role and that indeed, um, uh, you know, when you take a look at insurance providers, for example, the recognition absolutely is there now that professionals in the field of psychology have, uh, have as important, if not more important role uh, than a doctor, uh, a medical doctor in terms of, of, of your treatment. Uh, so again, contrasting the, the biomedical model with the biopsychosocial model is extremely important in terms of understanding where we're at right now in this whole field of health psychology. So the biopsychosocial uh, approach, um, you know, here's four ways psychology and illness are related. And again, this all has to do with what this modern emphasis is. Uh, illness can be caused by psychological factors. Take a look at the impact of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of stress uh, and um, uh, the formation of ulcers. You know, we've known about that connection for a very long period of time, um, but it's only been recently that you know we said, hey, we've got to engage people in stress reduction uh, in order to to prevent um, and to treat uh, ulcer uh, formation. 
Um, patient complaints uh, that have no organic basis, uh, individuals who have chronic headaches sometimes um, or, or other chronic kinds of conditions. You know, we're at a stage now where we really have to assume that a lot of this is psychological. Uh, again, there's uh, oftentimes there's no biological basis to this. So again, it's it's psychological. So we have to treat that psychological and sociological uh, um, uh, uh, basis um, of uh, of illness. Um, Psychological factors definitely can work indirectly to strengthen or weaken our physiology. Uh, again, just take a look at the impact of stress upon our immune system. Take a look at those studies that we talked about in that particular area uh, of, of learning, uh, where we we're you know, examining behavioral medicine um, and the, the relationships uh, between uh, our immune system, for example, and, um, and learning and how, how it can be modified. And lastly, you know, we have all of these unhealthy behaviors now that, that have just such a growing impact uh, in our society as well as in other societies, you know, smoking, drinking, use of drugs. Um, absolutely, those things are impacting us physiologically, but those are behaviors. And if we modify those behaviors, then indeed what we can do is we can, we can um, improve uh, health in individuals. We, we can, we can um, uh, even in individuals who have, uh, who have uh, for long periods of time engaged in these behaviors, uh, if they stop, uh, indeed uh, there's, there's positive outcomes uh, to this uh, in terms of our well-being, in terms of our, uh, of our health, and in terms of our behavior. So indeed, um, this approach is the approach now, um, the biopsychosocial approach instead of just the biomedical approach. This really is the modern emphasis uh, in healthcare. And this is the whole field of what we call um, health uh, psychology. So our conclusions then, you know, psychology has really contributed a lot. Uh, there's clear cut evidence that behavioral and social factors make us sick. Uh, and again, if you take a look at these uh, uh, rings that you have here, you know our health is the intersection of our social environment, uh, our biological or biomedical environment, and our psychological environment. And that's where our health really comes from. Now, field of psychology clearly has developed uh, some methods and treatments prevention strategies, you know, we're adopting really a public health model here in terms of uh, prevention. Uh, and these things now are having a dramatic impact uh, upon uh, health. They, they have been legitimized uh, in the last 30 or 40 years that the work of psychology in terms of prevention and health psychology uh, is clearly turning the tide uh, uh, in, in so many different areas uh, of health. So again, um, we transition from that biomedical model to the biopsychosocial model, and that transition has been good. This recognition, you know, really that, um, uh, you know, the, uh, our behavior uh, in our social environment uh, can absolutely impact um, illness. So uh, in our next lecture, we'll begin to take a look at the whole area of um, social psychology, which is a fascinating area of study uh, in the field of psychology.